Good morning and happy Father's Day. I'm Sean and it's great to be here with you this morning. If you're watching us for the first time, I'd like to invite you to fill out our Connect card. We'd love a chance to connect with you and to get to know you a little bit. For those of you in the Nashville area with school-age kids, I hope that you, could, you have June 26th to the 29th marked on your calendar. That is the week of Camp Village Kids. From 9 to 12 each day, your kids and their friends will be invited on a journey full of fun, games, amazing worship, and incredible truths from the Bible. There's a registration link here on the screen, or you can go to thevillagenashville.com slash events for more information. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by going to thevillagenashville.com slash give. It is because of your generosity that we will be welcoming over 100 kids into our building for Camp Village Kids. Some of these families will be experiencing the village and Jesus for the first time that week. We are grateful to be able to partner with you in this way. As we start our time together, let's take a minute or so, put aside our distractions, our phones, whatever it is, and let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come together as a community, whether in person or online, and worship your name. Help us listen for you this morning and go with us. In Christ's name I pray. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness If it wasn't for the cross Will you have won me With your kindness Chased me down when I was lost Where would I be If it cross hallelujah thank you Jesus I was a prisoner now I'm not with your blood you but my freedom hallelujah for the cross
Well, hello, and I want to add my welcome to you to The Village Online today. My name is Travis Garner. I'm one of the pastors here at The Village, and I am so glad that you're here with us. Uh, lots of things going on with us, a lot going on this summer uh, that I'm really excited about. One of those things is that here in a couple weeks, we're going to have our Camp Village kids right here uh, in person in the building. So if you're in the area or know anybody in the area, I just want to encourage you to sign up for that, sign up to volunteer for that, or to send somebody you know to be part of that here with us at the village. Uh, I want to pray for you wherever you are. So if you would, just close your eyes, take a deep breath. I need to take a deep breath. Maybe you do as well. God, thank you for who you are, for all the ways that you're at work. I pray that right now, no matter where we are, that you would speak. So speak to us. Speak through me or in spite of me. I just pray that you'd use me as, um, just use me as an instrument of your goodness and love and peace. And um, God, draw all of us who are here together today online, draw all of us closer to Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. We're continuing on in our journey through the Gospel of Luke this year. Today we turn to Luke chapter 10. I just want to read these verses from Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to go to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go! I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. So do not take a, a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. And if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. And if not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome to eat what is offered you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Then Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. And then Jesus says this, whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. And then the 72 returned with joy. I want to talk today about the fact that you and I have one job as human beings on this planet. We've got one responsibility. I just officiated a wedding yesterday. It's wedding season for me. I tell couples that when I'm marrying them. I say, you have one job when it comes to being a married couple. And then I read to them from the book of 1 John chapter 4, 17. Uh, the theme of the day at a wedding, of course, is always love. But 1 John 4 says this about love. It says, here's how love is made complete among us. In this world, we are like Jesus. Like This is how love is made complete. If you, like this day is about love. If you want your marriage to be about love, this is how love is made complete. In this world, we're like Jesus. And so I will say to a couple, your job is to show each other what the love of Jesus looks like when somebody lives it out. Well, it's similar for, for us. You and I have one job. We've got one responsibility that we've been given since the beginning of creation. We have one thing that is a win for us. I talked about this last week in Genesis chapter 1. It says that human beings were created in the image of God. In other words, human beings were made to mirror God to the rest of the world. The rest of the world is supposed to see what God looks like when they see us. The win for a follower of Jesus is simply this. Here's your one, here's your one win. It's for other people to hear about Jesus and to know Jesus and who he is. 
That's the win for us in life. The win for life, our one job is to know God and to make God known. That's it. That's our responsibility in this life. The most important responsibility that we've been given by God is to know God and to make God known. That is your job. That's your purpose in life. Uh, Today's Father's Day. Today's Father's Day. I just want to say a special word to dads. If you are a dad, that's your most important responsibility for your kids and your family. There is no greater win for your family than for you as a dad than for you to know God and for you to make God known in your family. For you to know God and for you to make God known to your kids. There's no greater win. There's no greater responsibility for you as a dad. And I just want to say this today. If you feel like you're behind on that, if you feel like you've messed that up, if you feel like you you haven't been what you've needed to be, I just want to encourage you, Father's Day 2023, this is the day that you can press the reset button on that. And starting today, don't feel bad about it. Don't get down on yourself. Don't look backwards to the past and the mistakes that you've made. All of us have made mistakes, but God says, hey, you get a new chance every day. And so today, Father's Day 2023, what if you said today and moving forward, I'm going to know God and I'm going to make God known to my kids and my family in whatever way I can. It's the same thing that's true for all of us. When you go to work, your job is to know God and to make God known. When you go to school, your job is to know God and to make God known. When you're cheering on the sidelines, your job, and I've I've been in some bleachers lately where this has absolutely been needed, your job is to know God and to make God known. That's what's happening here in this passage from Luke chapter 10. Jesus begins to commission more and more and more disciples, and he's saying to them, again, your job Your job is the same job that you've had since the beginning of creation. It's to know God and to make God known. It says, after this, I'll I'll read it again. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, I love this. This isn't just a throwaway number. Jesus, Jesus does things very intentionally and very strategically. So when Jesus appointed 12 disciples... That was a very intentional number because in the Old Testament, there are 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus is saying, through me and through these 12 disciples, this is a new representation of the people of God. And the work of God that started in the Old Testament is now continuing in me. Well, in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, there's a, there's a point at which Moses gets really tired. He is worn out. He can't do the work anymore. And he says to God, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this by myself anymore. I need help. And so God says to Moses, I want you to gather 70 people together and bring them to the tent of meeting where I meet with you. And I'm going to take some of my spirit that I put on you and I'm going to put it on these 70 people and then they'll join you in doing this work. When Jesus sends out 72 people, it's a representation of the continuation of the work of God through the people. Uh, He told them, Jesus told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. So here Jesus is using language from farming and agriculture. I love this. Later on in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes about the fruits of the Spirit, also agricultural language. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit, this is how you know that the Holy Spirit is, is at work and alive in somebody's life. They will have a life that's marked by these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the nine marks that the Holy Spirit is at work in somebody's life. And what Jesus is saying, he's using this agricultural language, and he's saying, these seeds have been planted all over the place. I've been planting them in people's hearts. I've been planting them in people's lives, and I want you to go now, and I want you to help them grow, right? They've, They've grown to an extent, but that's what I want for everybody on the planet. I want everybody on the planet's life to be marked by love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about that. Like, think about if your life and the lives of all the people around you were marked by those nine things, what kind of a difference that would make. Every interaction, every conversation, every decision, every relationship was marked by those 
beautiful things of God that are growing in the people around you. So that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I want you to go out and do this. And he's also saying this. This is so cool. He's saying it's not just a little harvest. He says the harvest is plentiful. I've been sowing seeds in all kinds of places that you may not even know about. This is not intended to be just for a small group of people, right? This isn't just supposed to be like a little holy huddle that we hold together and hold to ourselves, right? We're supposed to do this in big ways for many, many, many multitudes of people. Now, sometimes as, as followers of Jesus, we can get kind of selfish when it comes to sharing what we have. Like we can be in a group and say, you know what? I really like this group and this group only, and we don't want to share. We're, we don't want to share this with anybody else. Or we can be like, we like our church. I had somebody tell me just the other day who was visiting here and asked me, what size is your church? And I, I told her about how many people were here on a Sunday, and she shook her head and like made a sour face like, no, 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 I don't like that size of a church. I just want a small church. Some of us, we want to just keep what we have contained, and we don't want to share it with other people. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 this is a plentiful harvest and we've got to think big about the numbers of people that we want to reach with the good news and the message of Jesus. Here it goes on and Jesus says, do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Why not? Why would Jesus say don't take a purse or a bag or sandals? Here's why. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm going to provide everything that you need along the way. Right? He, he's not saying a purse or bag or sandals are bad things. He's not against those things. He's simply trying to say to the 70, hey, this isn't about what you do with what you have. This is about what I do through you with what I've already given you. Right? So this isn't about how good you are at this. Uh, this isn't about how good you look at this. This isn't about how much training you have. This isn't about how much skill that you have in doing this. This is about the fact that I am able and I am willing to work through you as long as you're willing to go where I ask you to go and do what I ask you to do. And then Jesus says, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. And then he says, stay there, stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house. I love this notion that you see Jesus working in a couple different kinds of environments, right? You see Jesus working with the multitudes, the crowds. You've got, you've got the big sermons where Jesus is preaching to thousands of people. You see this in the ministry of Jesus. You see this in the book of Acts after Jesus where the apostles gather at the temple courts, but they also meet together in people's homes. And, and in this instance, Jesus is saying the crowd is important and the small community is also important. And he says, hey, don't, don't move around, don't move around, but I want you to kind of plant yourselves in a community, in a home, and allow my ministry and my message to kind of work out of a home. And, and, and I love this. Um, I love this notion. This is what we try to do with our groups. We have our gatherings together here on Sundays, but then we have groups who meet in homes. And the reason for that is that's what Jesus said to do. It's like, it's like he, wants, he wants your house and my house to be an outpost of mission in our neighborhood. He wants the people in your neighborhood to be more loved because you're there and your house is there. And he wants you to use your house to love other people, right? So, so if you're a follower of Jesus and everything that you have actually comes from God and belongs to God, that means that even your house belongs to Jesus. And, and if it's at all possible for you, I think God might say, hey, what would it look like for you to start a group right here in your house, to allow people to meet in your house, to allow people to pray in your house, to allow people to meet Jesus in your house? What might that look like for you? And if you've got a couch, you know, Jesus might say, how cool would it be to invite people into your home week after week after week and, and to pray together and discuss together and, and learn together and to see people's lives changed on your couch. It's like Jesus is saying, if you have a couch, that couch actually belongs to me. And I want to see people's lives changed on that couch as you're doing this work out of your home. When you enter a town and are welcomed there, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus is asking those 70 to do two things. After you, after you establish yourself in a house, 
I want you to do two things in that neighborhood, in that village, in that community. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is the strategy of Jesus that he gives to the disciples. He's saying this is outwardly focused. Go to another place or set up in a, in a home that's away from the, the larger community gathering place. And in that place, heal the people who are sick and tell other people that the kingdom of God has come near. You, you actually see Jesus models this himself. Jesus, Jesus was in the comforts of heaven, in his heavenly home with God. And Jesus was sent out as a missionary to take on human flesh, to become a person, and to begin to preach and to heal the sick. That's what Jesus did. He was sent out into the culture. And now he's saying, okay, we started with the 12 and I've sent them out. And now I've got the 70 and I'm sending them out. But, but Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't been willing to do myself. And so he sends these people out. He tells them the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. We need to increase the number of workers who are going out into the harvest field. And that's why I'm sending you. That's why I'm sending you out. And so here are three things that I want to ask us to do that I think Jesus would say we're supposed to do in healing the sick and proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. Three things. Number one, I think that means that we're supposed to live questionable lives. Live questionable lives. Right? It was questionable to go into a community and heal people who were sick People who welcome people who were outcasts, touch people who were the untouchable, talk to people who were the unforgivable. It was unfathomable that people would do that in this culture in the first century. Well, you know what? We've got a lot of people who are not welcomed in our culture. We've got a lot of people who are outcasts. We've got a lot of people who are sick. There are a lot of people who some people will tell you not to talk to. There are a lot of people who some people will tell you not to go near, not to have anything to do with. And I just wonder what would it look like for us to live questionable lives, live a life filled with the fruit of spirit, live a life filled with the kindness of God in such a way that it, it's noticeable because it's so different from how people around you live. What would it look like for us to live questionable lives? I think that's what we're supposed to do. The second thing I think we're supposed to do is to say questionable things. To say questionable things. Maybe not in the way that you think, though, right? There's some common ways of speaking to each other in our culture. It is more and more and more common for people to just sit behind a keyboard and let it rip and take people down, and tear people down, and cancel other people. It's just more and more and more frequent and common that we try to just burn it all down when we disagree with somebody. Or, or when we make a mistake to not own it, and not apologize, and not ask for forgiveness. Or when somebody else wrongs us, not to forgive them. That's what's common in our culture. But what would it look like for us to say questionable things? Some examples of questionable things that we could say would be things like, I'm sorry. Those two words can change a lot of things. I'm sorry. I forgive you. There's power in those three words. I forgive you. Will you forgive me? I've messed it up. Will you forgive me? I was wrong. I was wrong. Or even this one, just to say to somebody, hey, I love you. Those are questionable things to say in our culture. They're noticeable because they're different. And when people question us on the things that we do, the questionable things that we do, when they question us on the questionable things that we say, it leads us to the third thing that I want to say to us today that I think we're supposed to do in light of this passage. And it's simply to tell your story. Live questionable lives. Say questionable things and tell your story. Here's the thing. Our words that we speak, our actions that we perform without speaking, they build a platform. It's like they, if we live questionable lives and say questionable things, it's as if it builds a platform in the midst of the people that we know and it gives us an opportunity to tell our story of why we do the things that we do and why we say the things 
that we say. Now, some of you, some of you, I, I know this, I've, I've said this and thought this, you might be like, well, wait a minute, there's that great saying that I think Francis of Assisi said, which was, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. I think that's a great thought. That's what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying, live a questionable life, live in such a way that your actions point to something beyond yourself. But I think it's an incomplete thought. Because people don't come to know Jesus and the love of Jesus just by watching people. We have to, with our words, with our stories, we've got to connect the dots between the actions of God and the love of God and the person of God. Every single one of us has to take the opportunity to tell our story. Now, you might be, you might be sitting there today going, that's great. I agree with that. Somebody needs to tell the story of Jesus. But Travis, you're the preacher, so that's your job. You might be thinking that, like, that's your job. Your job, Travis, is to tell people about Jesus. Like, you went to school for that. I'm sure you had some training on that. You've got some practice in that. Your job is to tell people about Jesus. But I, I'm just a teacher, right? So I'm just a banker, I'm just a lawyer, I'm just a mechanic, I'm just a nurse. My job is to nurse. My job is to bank. My job is to teach. My job is to lawyer or lawyers. I don't my job is to law, right? Your job is to tell people about Jesus. And I would just say that's a really narrow way of seeing this. You know, one of the other reasons and other connections for why Jesus sent out 70 people. It's because in that time in the first century, it was thought that there were 70 nations. And by choosing that number 70, Jesus was saying, this is a message for all the people and by all the people. Every single one of us is called and instructed and sent by Jesus to do questionable things, to say questionable things, but also to tell our story. Right? We want to go everywhere. We want to go everywhere that we are, every corner, every ball field, every office, every cubicle, every classroom, every desk, every boardroom, every meeting area, every lobby, every store, everywhere that we are with an opportunity to tell about the love of Jesus at work in our lives, right? You and I, we've each got a platform in our lives with which we can tell our story. And the more you work the more you do the things of God, the more solid your platform becomes and the more opportunities you'll have to tell your story. And, and, and your, your witness is simply, you don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to be able to exegete everything in the Bible. You don't have to connect all the dots from Genesis to Revelation. All you have to do is tell the story of what God is doing in your life and nobody can argue with that, right? Nobody can argue with your experience. Nobody can argue with your story. It doesn't have to be remarkable. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be articulate. It's just got to be your story. If you look in the Gospels, there's the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and Jesus meets her at the well, and she's been married five times, and now she's living with a man who's not her husband, and Jesus meets her at the well, and they have this interaction, and and, and Jesus says, well, go, go back and, and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that's right. I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't your husband. And the woman has this epitome or this um, epiphany of faith, and she runs back into the town. And you know what her story is? This is her story. She just says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. That's her story of Jesus. And you know what happens? Half of the town, half of the town comes out and they come to faith in Jesus because she simply said, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did, right? That's her story. Uh, there's a story of Tim Tebow in, uh, in 2009. Uh, he's playing for the Florida Gators and, and all season long, Tim Tebow had been on his eye black. He'd been writing Philippians 314 on his eye black. That was his, that was his whole thing, which is I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And, and before the national championship game, uh, Tim Tebow felt like for some reason, he felt like God was leading him to write a different message 
on his eye black. And he felt like God was, was asking him to simply write John 3.16. And so on his eye black, Tim Tebow just wrote John 3.16. That's it. He went out, played in the national championship game. I think they won. Well, it came out later that something like 94 million people Googled John 3.16 during the national championship game or thereafter, simply because they saw Tim Tebow's eye black. It's not a, he didn't do anything spectacular. I mean, winning the national championship in the eyes, that's spectacular, right? But he just used his platform to tell a story just by writing a simple message on his eyes. Uh, uh, Trevor Lawrence, I heard a story about Trevor Lawrence when several years after that, Trevor Lawrence was the quarterback for Clemson and, and he won the national championship. And during the interview, during the interview, one of the reporters asked him, how did you keep it together this year? And just kind of talking in the interview, he just said, man, I don't, I don't know if I would have been able to make it this year without my small group. That was his story. That was his story of Jesus that he had to tell. Some of you think, some of you think that you don't have any kind of story to tell about Jesus and, and the impact that he's had on your life because you've always had faith, right? You were, maybe you were raised in a Christian home. Jesus has just always been part of your life as long as you can remember. Well, maybe you could say something like, if that's you, maybe you could say something like, you know what, before I met Jesus, I was drooling a lot. And I pooped my pants all the time, and I kept yelling no at my parents every time they would say something to me, and then I met Jesus. Like, maybe that could be your story. It doesn't have to be a dramatic story. It's just simply telling something about what God is doing in your life right now. Maybe it's something that you're learning. Maybe it's a way that you've been supported by a group of people who've gathered around you. Maybe, uh, maybe it's the fact that, hey, I've just started reading my Bible lately and I'm finding that it's making this change in my heart as I go about my day. Whatever your story is, you've got to tell your story. Live a questionable life. Say questionable things and tell your story and tell your story. Jesus is sending you just like he's sending me out to do that. So today, Here's what I want to ask us to do together as we close out our time. I want, I want to ask you to circle a date on your calendar. This is almost like, hey, this is the time when I am sending us out. Jesus is sending us out. All of us who call the village our church home, he's sending us out. And I want us to circle one date together on our calendar. So if you need to get your phone out to mark your calendar for this day, or if you've got a paper, like whatever you need to do to circle this date. So in Sharpie or electronic Sharpie or whatever you've got, I want us all to circle the date August the 6th on the calendar. Sunday, August 6th. Six. Now listen, if you're looking at Sunday, August 6th, and you, you've already got plans, good news. You have seven weeks to change your plans. So I want you to circle Sunday, August the 6th. If you're in person with us here, if you're local, I want you to prioritize being here with us on that day. But more than that, more even more than just you being here by yourself, I want you to be here with somebody else that you've invited. Another person, another family, a neighbor, a family member, a coworker, a friend. If you're online and you don't live near here, I want to encourage you to try this. What if on August the 6th, you invited somebody else to join you for the Village Online? And maybe you could do brunch afterwards, another family, another person, a coworker, a neighbor, a friend, everybody on your street. What would it look like for you? Circle that date, August 6th, and invite somebody to join you for the Village Online on that day. And here's what we're going to do here in person, just so you know if you're here. On that day, we're going to have a big all-ages celebration. We're going, to, uh, we're going to conclude our time together on that morning by praying for the year, praying for students, recognizing and praying for teachers, praying for parents. Uh, we're going to have gifts for any teachers who are here on that day. So, so like, if you already know that you're going to need to bribe your teacher this year, this is the day to invite them to come sit with you at the village. This is the Sunday to do that. If you're a teacher, this is the Sunday that you've been waiting for to invite all of your teacher friends because they're literally going to get something out of it. If you know other parents, it's an easy invite on that day to say, hey, you know what? The school year can be crazy. And, and at our church, the village on Sunday, we're just going to spend a little bit of time taking a breath and praying for the year, right? Uh, I, I want you to know that I'm making a vow to you that I'm not going to say anything weird on that Sunday, right? Uh, that's my promise. I, I'm not going to say or do anything weird. So I'm not going to talk about money. 
I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm going to do my very best to be on my very best behavior. And, and I'm not going to do anything intentionally to embarrass you, right? So it's, it's going to be a message that's simply designed to encourage us as we're starting back into the fall. And, and it's also going to be a kickoff to, to an amazing August. Maybe, maybe we'll call it that, amazing August. So, so the following week on August the 13th, our village kids are going to have a big kind of blowout party, carnival type atmosphere. And our village youth on that night are gonna have a party on the hill to kick things off. On August the 27th, we'll have our annual Scent Sunday where we go out and serve in the community. And again, that's a date you could circle if you're not near here, but maybe you could find a way to go out and serve in your community with a group of people on that day. But our focus for the next seven weeks is Sunday, August the 6th. And so for the next seven weeks, I'm going to ask you in response to what Jesus says here, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one, pray. Number two, invite. Right? I'm, I'm not asking everybody to invite somebody to church every week, but I'm asking everybody to invite somebody to come sit with you on August the 6th. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. I'm at work in all kinds of places out there, but the workers are few. The people who are willing to go out and join me in that are few. And ask the Lord of the harvest, Jesus says, to increase, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then in case he wasn't clear about that, again, he said, go, I'm sending you. Go, I'm sending you. So we're gonna kick off our seven weeks of praying together by praying right now. I want you to close your eyes wherever you are and bow your heads. And I would just say, God, right now, in a few moments of silence, I pray that you'd begin to put on our hearts and in our minds, the names and faces of people in our community in our neighborhood, on our street, at work, at school, where maybe you're already doing some things. Maybe you're already stirring. Maybe you've already begun to plant some seeds. So God, right now, would you put, put in, our, in our minds and on our hearts the names and faces of specific people? Would you begin to do that? Some of, us, some of us are getting really clear images right now, really clear names right now, and some of us aren't, and that's okay. And so God, we, we just kick off this season of prayer and invitation by, by praying for our neighbors. God, we pray for our neighbors today, and we pray for our coworkers. We pray for our teachers. We pray for our friends. We pray for the people that we cheer alongside on the weekends. We pray for the people that we interact with at the store. We pray that the people in our community would come to know the love of Jesus. And I pray today, God, that they would come to know the love of Jesus, not, not just generally or not just by osmosis, but, but that they would come to know the love of Jesus through us through the things that we do that are questionable, through the things that we say that are questionable and through the ways that we tell our story of what you're doing in our lives. So God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Make me an offering 
Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Again, if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Please take just a minute to fill out our Connect card so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We're so grateful that you took some time out of your day to join us this morning. As you go into your week, know that our staff is always praying for you. But if you have specific prayer requests that you'd like to share with us, you can email them to prayer at thevillagenashville.com. Let's close our morning of worship. God, we thank you for this community, for this time, and for your voice that we get to hear. God, help us answer the call to be a follower and to love our neighbor. Keep us safe and keep us healthy. In your name we pray. Amen.